first half is just unacceptable. Unacceptable. Played terrible. His words, not mine. You are Locked On Cougs, your daily podcast on the Houston Cougars, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Cougs, the daily podcast about your Houston Cougars. I'm your host, Houston-born teacher and coach Parker Aintroth, here to break down all things Cougs. If a U of H fan or just a hater comes that by, and today I imagine there are probably several of you, please be sure to subscribe down below, and that way you can lay us on the Cougs into your news feed each and every day. We do appreciate you being a first-time listener, first-morning listener every single day. We appreciate you starting morning with Locked On Cougs. Um, Remember, if you found us on the YouTube channel, hit subscribe because we are doing a giveaway every 250 subscribers. Um, so make sure you subscribe to help us get there and then comment on the video to tell us uh, that you're in the contest. Now, if after talking about this game in particular against Rice, you're wondering what on earth to say completely randomly, why don't you tell us down below what group of five or what young up and coming coaches you really like watching play or have watching their teams play football um all right so i said to say a couple of things but one we we're going to talk in the first segment about um this idea of being unacceptable because that was the overarching theme of one of the post-game press conferences after houston did lose to rice um the second segment we'll talk about trapping and trap game because that may have been what happened and the third segment we'll talk about what comes next that's a lot of soft skilly type of things coming out of this game um I like that kind of analysis if you're looking for like x's and o's and that kind of stuff i'm planning on doing more of that in tuesday's episode before we put this game away to kind of then build off of learning from the x's and o's mistakes um but yes if you are just now here if you were under a rock this weekend at a fall wedding or something in september uh, kudos you did not miss much uh except that houston did lose to rice in overtime 43 to 41 double overtime i should say 43 to 41 and frankly there's a lot of the game that did not feel even that close um and quickly recapping the game houston did go down 28 to nothing on rice's first four possessions um houston then scored to make it 28 7 and had an interception just before the half um for it's worth the interception was in the end zone and rice was driving Houston came in the second half and had a long drive to open the half where they very much controlled the ball and the clock and seemed to build some confidence, but ultimately came away with no points. Um, Houston would begin scoring about, you know, late, late third, or sorry, late, late sec, late, late third quarter. I'm speaking, I promise. And late, late third quarter going into the fourth quarter, they would tie it up with just about 15 seconds left to play and go into overtime. Houston then scored to open the overtime, meaning they'd reeled off 35 unanswered points. Rice scored on their overtime possession, forced double overtime. Rice went first in the second overtime and scored a questionable, to say the uh, it was a bad pass interference call, gave them a second chance two-point conversion, and they got it. Houston then scored a touchdown and had to get the two-point conversion to tie and force a third overtime. Ab, right before they called their play, Rice calls a timeout. Houston comes out from the timeout and throws a jump ball to Matthew Golden, which he could not come down with. And that's how it happened. Now, we'll talk more X and O's tomorrow about why XYZ happened or, or what happened on a rewatch of the game. Um, but some interesting stuff came out of the post game on this. Um, and I want to start with a quote from Dana Holgerson. I'll show on the screen for the, for the video audience. But for the audio audience... Those first eight possessions, it's unacceptable, or the first seven possessions, because yeah, I think you realize that on the eighth possession, they actually scored uh, 100% unacceptable. Not ready to play, not respecting our opponent, thought we could just play. Dana said several things to that effect over the course of the game, of, of the post-game press conference, about that performance being unacceptable. And that's exactly what it was. Houston came out to start a rivalry game and let an inferior opponent a score score on four straight possessions. And if you think I'm just being ridiculous, they scored on four straight possessions and then did not score again until after 
regulation. Now, I understand that they might have been trying to take their foot off the gas and this, that, and the other thing. But at the end of the day, that to me demonstrates that Houston could have kept them off the scoreboard for a lot longer. Yes, I know Rice is not the Rice of old, and they have JT Daniels, and they're in the American now, and you know they have one of the McCaffrey brothers and all those kinds of things. And Luke McCaffrey and JT Daniels are very talented. JT Daniels should not be, with that roster around him, 400 yards passing against Houston talent right they, like there's a reason he's been bouncing around schools for six or seven years now whatever it is and has not gone pro yet right 400 yards against the houston cougars passing is a lot now i will say uh, and we'll do more x no stuff like i said on tuesday episode there's absolutely a false sense of security idea here that coach holgerson also alluded to in the post game where the defense had a very good week in week one and then had a very bad week in week two likely resting on their laurels from having played a talented UTSA team. If I were a gambler, I'm not necessarily a gambler, but if I were a gambler, I'd bet UTSA beats Rice later this year uh, if and when they have to match up. But that doesn't negate one another. Right? You can have a good defense that played well in week one, and then they just don't play their roles or do their jobs in week two. That doesn't mean you don't have the same talented guys from week one, right? Malik Fleming is still Malik Fleming. A.J. Halsey has made plays in each game. Isaiah Hamilton made a couple plays in the second half of the Rice game itself. Nelson Caesar we've talked about, right? Um, he had he had another couple big sacks. Uh, I believe he got credited with two full sacks in this game itself. Um, but unacceptable, and this is where I want to you know finish this segment, is not talking about the game itself too much more. How many times will we hear... That was unacceptable. And further, and while there, Dana did somewhat say in post game, like it is on him, it is on him, it is on him. I don't mean to say he dismissed credit, but at some point he's telling us all that the unacceptable play, the unacceptable performance is on him. And it is on the head coach, right? Not being ready to play a football game is on the head coach because that's part of the job description, right? Dana calls a brilliant offense. I maintain, as I said in the post-game show, which is also on our YouTube feed, if you want to check that out, um, it should be wherever you get your podcast by the time you're listening to this one. I maintain that Dana Holgerson likely took over the play calling midway through the second quarter. Feels a lot like the Memphis game a year ago, right? But at some point, all of those things, not taking over the play calling earlier in the season, not having a good play caller that's ready to go, not having a clear system to cut out, or not having the defense ready to make stops, not having a clear-cut game. At some point, those things also all fall to his lap, right? And at some point, just having these games happen so, so frequently, and then being like, ah, you know, unacceptable. That's on me. How many times does that get to happen? Because it feels like we're batting about once a year, if not more. Now, he, he said this several different ways. I want to talk something about his, his week of practice to, uh, in the segment. He mentioned that we had a good Tuesday. Wednesday, you know, the uh, luncheon was, I wasn't happy. Um, the luncheon wasn't happy. I warned, uh, we didn't practice good. I warned them, you know, I don't know. Maybe we practiced too hard on Tuesday. I can't explain it. Maybe it's a trap game. Maybe it's a trophy game. Maybe it's a rival game. Maybe we're looking for the Big 12 TCU I don't know, maybe we didn't respect our opponent and they whipped our tail. He would continue with, uh, at the end of the day, it is on me. He talked about the false sense of security, as I mentioned. And then he tried to wrap it positive, and, and I want to give him credit for this, that you know they did come out after halftime and execute. They did come out after halftime and compete for a couple quarters. But then he fell to, I don't understand, he can get it to overtime and not have the will to win. Again, that is a head coaching thing. That is a part of his job. And I don't mean that to say he will never be able to do this job, but at some point we have to ask, why isn't it happening? Now, I understand that there are things that Dana does very well, and like I've said a thousand times on this podcast, at some point we have to admit that like there are a hundred schools in America that would take Dana in a heartbeat. But these things have to get fixed, and there needs to be some work within the athletic department, within the football building, within those offices to get these things fixed. Because getting guys ready to play, full stop, is a part of the head coach's job. Having guys work through practice and not show up overconfident, not, not show up not confident, but not show up where they're point where they're like looking past an opponent 
is on a head coach. Those are parts of the job description. And if he's just going to call plays, then maybe we need to have that conversation too. Now, I want to talk about something because I think that, honestly, we probably all ended that game like, man, I need something cold to drink. It's hot outside, and it's hot in Houston. All right, now it's time for our Game Changer of the Week, brought to you by Athletic Brewing. That's a little more challenging in a week where you lose to your rival in Rice, I admit. However, we do have a couple players that had pretty strong second halves to talk about for sure. I will also point out that Donovan Smith is our Game Changer of the Week because of the total production the guy had. I really thought very seriously about giving this to Sam Brown or Stacey Sneed, but it felt like the overall production of Donovan put him over the top. He had 260 yards, passing and an impactful 57 yards rushing three rushing touchdowns two passing touchdowns really really strong second half out of the signal caller as he's getting used to the new spot um big big time performance even if it didn't come out with houston cougars on top now athletic brewing company has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game much like donovan changes the football game for the houston cougars their brews are great tasting and award winning and they beat out full strength beers in global competitions so you can find athletic brewing companies non-alcoholic brews at your stores at the stores nearest you or you can buy online at athleticbrewing.com first-time customers can use code locked on to get 15 percent off your first order that's code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n at checkout for 15 percent off at athleticbrewing.com near beer exclusions and conditions apply athletic brewing company fit for all times um all right so in looking at this game and what could have happened as far as being unprepared because Dana admitted that the effort was unacceptable. He also admitted that Wednesday and Thursday and Friday leading into a rivalry game on Saturday were not their best practice, which is astonishing because Tuesday he's on the radio show Tuesday night talking about how great their practice was. He reiterated in the post game on Saturday that Tuesday is one of their best practices, and then they just dropped the ball the rest of the week. And, you know, I think it's really easy to try and overcomplicate that and think about, like, what could that be from? But in the postgame, Nelson Caesar, who, if I'm going to give grades here, is one of the had one of the better performances on the Houston Cougars. Um, in fact, if I'm going to pull up the pro football focus stats, he actually had one of the higher scores. Uh, he had the fourth highest score on the roster. On Saturday, um, but Nelson sees in the post game himself mentioned that I just feel like we we're looking at our schedule. And like I said, me personally, I was more focused on the excitement of going into the Big 12. I was just ready to get those preseason games out of the way and finally go in, be able to play against a Big 12 opponent. Like I said, that's our fault. We're supposed to take it like a pro. You know what I mean? A pro is going to take it week by week, no matter who they're playing now a i should point out nelson i don't think this will ever get back to nelson um but as a captain and leader of this defense and frankly a guy that i thought played on a defense that did not play very well in the first half i got i personally still thought played very well nice to see the pro football focus analytics back me up on that um the ownership of this right the idea that like this was a controllable thing that they did wrong and he's not trying to beat around the bush. He's not blaming the two-point conversion call or getting a second shot at it for Rice in the, in the overtime. He's not blaming some missed holding calls. He's not blaming anything. He's owning it. And if we were going to keep moving this, I guess the one positive takeaway of these post-game press conference conversations is that there was a lot of ownership. The deal is that next, there needs to be some action, right? Um, but in getting trapped here, and we admittedly maybe this is on me last week you and i did not talk about this as a trap game that was not my frame of reference and that approach as a trap game because while it was an inferior opponent between two very talented ones and that's that's the makeup for a trap game utsa great g5 team you got to go out there and play ball not so great team cross town whatever blah, blah blah then you play tcu come off their bid to the national championship last year and so on and so forth right that middle game is a natural valley and it's easy to like look past that one. I have to admit, the fact that there was a trophy on the line, the fact that there was a rivalry, the fact that these were in town, made me think that perhaps Houston had a little bit of an advantage. And 
maybe could skip past this idea of a trap game. Now, with that said, I got to admit, um, I was wrong. I didn't talk about it like a trap game because I didn't think that could happen. And maybe, clearly, we should have, right? I assumed that having something tangible to win at the end of this game would make it not that. But based on the things Nelson said, that was not the case. Nelson would also say to open his press conference, right, as part of the press conference, that I felt like we looked at them as a smaller opponent. I feel like a lot of us in the locker room, including myself, who was looking forward to next week more than taking it a week at a time, right? He would finish later by saying, I think you just got to look at our schedule. I think I feel like a lot of us were like, man, we got this team, we got this team, we got this team, you know, going one after the other. And it's like we were more focused on those teams, or I can't say everybody, I cannot say everybody, but I mean, I feel like me, Nelson Caesar talking, I caught myself looking forward, looking at a couple weeks ahead, you know what I mean? I'm just getting a little excited rather than just focusing on one week at a time. That's an admission. And that's an admission that Sam Brown alluded to in his as well, but maybe not as bluntly. It's an admission that Dana Holgerson alluded to may have been happening in the locker room. And frankly, that's worrisome. The Houston Cougar team is coming off of a down season last year. Yes, they went eight and five. And for some programs, that's strong. But for a program that went 12 and two the year before, and for a program that's sitting in the recruiting hotbed of America that is Houston, and for this, a program that is supposed to be climbing to new heights as they move into Big 12. That's an admission of guilt in a way that cannot happen. Full stop. Now, is it human nature? Yes. Did I just admit on this podcast that I assumed it was impossible to do that? Sure. Did I go back and like after like some self-reflection look at like the the pregame short I put up on YouTube and TikTok and stuff on Saturday morning? Did I allude to in that like to, we're going to get through this game, get on to the Big 12? Yes. It's exciting. It's human nature. But part of what makes powerful athletes strong athletes, mentally tough athletes and good programs, the tough athletes and good programs that they are, is that honestly, they look through those things and get past it anyway. Now, if you're like me and you took some L's this weekend, both in the Houston Cougar game and out of it, in the third segment, I'll talk about what comes next. But first, we should probably talk some about how to get back on top with our buddies at FanDuel. Because you can get ready for the NFL season with the incredible offers from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. All customers who bet $5 get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. Uh, I'm looking at Monday night's game. Ed Oliver and the Buffalo Bills head to New York to take on the Jets. The Bills are a two and a half point favorite. And I think I am taking them in that Ed Oliver defense because I'm not buying the Aaron Rodgers and New York Jets hype. They might score some points. I got Garen Wilson, my fantasy team. But I will say, on the whole, I think that guys like Ed Oliver make the difference in that one. And I'm telling you to do it. Go place your bets on the Bills for Monday Night Football at FanDuel. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use. You can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right. Um, what comes next? We've seen this script before. We, we know what comes next. Now, we know what comes next because uh, I think it was Duarte asked in the post game of First, a coach, and then Nelson Caesar, and then Sam Brown each. But Houston has had, it feels like, a loss to a team they should not lose to every year for a long, long time now. Um, if this is this year's, Rice is 2023, right? 2022, I would argue, was Tulsa to end the regular season, right? They should not have lost that football game. They were a better team over the course of the year than Tulsa and then lost to Tulsa, right? Some people might say the SMU game was crazy high scoring, Um and I would admit the defense played awful in that one, right? But the offense played well enough to win that game. They scored 60 points. Um, in, in the the Tulsa game, I don't th think anybody did, right? 2021, um, I guess that, you know, they went 12-2, and two, so it's hard to pick a team shouldn't have lost to. But they lost to a Texas Tech team that was kind of down. Um, I would almost argue that, that because of how talented 2021's team was, that kind of feels like a game they should have won. Um, I would also point out, like, they 
only beat a bad Navy team by a touchdown or in eight points, right? So um, is that the game potentially? That was that year, even though they won a close one. 2020 was a weird year, um, and there was the COVID year. People were in, people were out. Hard to hold that year against anyone, but they did lose to a bad Memphis team that year. They probably should have won that one. 2019, it was Tulane. Um, in 2018, when they were ranked, they lost to a bad SMU team. In uh, 2017, it was again Tulane. Uh, 2016, it was weird because they got undefeated throughout. They beat Oklahoma to start the year. They got away as high as 13 and then lost to SMU and they had the inverse. It was Navy and then SMU in the span of three weeks, right? Like a very talented team goes into two teams that are clearly demonstrably better than and loses twice in three weeks. Uh, 2015, they went 13-1 and that year, but their one loss was to a below 500 UConn team. They might have been an even bigger bowl game at the end of it, right? Like as you keep on going back, this is a thing Houston's had to deal with before through a number of different coaches, right? That That run overlapped with, Herman overlapped with major and now Dan, like it's, it's not a one coach thing. Even it's, it's kind of a, a bigger thing. We've got to find a way to continue to fix. But what is interesting to me is in each of those instances, and people say different things about Tulsa last year, because the last regular season game and then the bowl game was ultimately against Louisiana or whatever, I guess. But um, Houston has typically found ways to bounce back. Um, we don't know what happens rights this year, but again, last year they went on to win the bowl game. And it was the most, you know, frozen temperature game Houston's ever played in by leaps and bounds, right? They won that game. Uh, after losing to Texas Tech in 2021, they went on to have the 12-2 and two season and play in a, and, they bring, and beat Auburn and all those kinds of things, right? That was all in the same year, the same year that they shouldn't have lost to Texas Tech. Uh, you go back, I mentioned the 13-1 and one season after UConn, they went on one, the Peach Bowl, right? Like these things happen over the course of Houston Cougar football where they drop again, they shouldn't, and respond. That for Houston means responding in TCU week. After all, right? We heard them mention throughout the week that, or throughout the uh, post game, that they'd been overlooking Rice to look at uh, TCU over the course of practice. They, they'd been getting more ready for TCU mentally, it sounds like, than Rice. Well, that's just talk until they actually play TCU, right? That's all that is. All they're doing by saying that is saying, oh, we look past these guys. But if you're then not ready to play TCU, then what were you actually looking at? Right? Like if, if the goal was to look past Rice, or not the goal, but if the accident was looking past Rice because you were going to go out there and really lay one on TCU, well, then you, you kind of need to go lay one on TCU to make it look like that. At least show up in a competitive light, right? Uh, look like you've put the Rice game behind you and go out and play with TCU. And then the actual trap game when I was like mapping out my schedule for Houston was not Rice, but was Sam Houston State, which is squarely between two Big 12 opponents. Um, and admittedly, Sam Houston State is a home game, but Sam Houston's not far. I would imagine that's one of their bigger games. You'll see people there. Um, and frankly, it's the final. If Houston has four straight games in the city of Houston. It's the final of those four before going on the road to Lubbock. Um, that would be the trap game I thought we would have had coming. Right? Do we lay an effort egg in that one? Not that I think Sam Houston State, uh, frankly, with JT Daniels, Rice might be better than Sam Houston State, um, but that would have been the game I saw coming as a trap game. As I mentioned earlier in the episode, I wouldn't have thought Rice was the trap game because of what's on the line there. Now, I will say um, that I think as far as what comes next for Houston, this season is not lost. Yes, that's a trophy game. Yes, it sucks to lose. Yes, it's a team you don't want to lose to in a rivalry or in any sort of context, really, because you don't lose any game, I guess, right? But Rice, there seems to be something more to it. At least there was this week for them something more to it. But truthfully, you can go on and do things like win the Big 12. You can go on and do, th I mean, they're not, I don't think they win the Big 12 this year or not, but like those things are not off the table. You can go out and win Big 12 games like TCU. You can go out and win games like Baylor. Baylor still looks bad, right? You can go out and win games like Cincinnati, Oklahoma State. You can finish the game on a win against UCF. And suddenly it's like, oh, you're ball eligible again. Like this does not in and of itself eliminate Houston from ball eligibility. And frankly, if this is the lone mistake on the year in and of itself, I don't know that it's a horribly fireable offense. We don't know what Rice looks like over the course of their season with JT Daniels taking the snaps. I mean, if they were to win the American Athletic Conference, do we look back at this game differently like we did with Tulane a year ago, right? Last year, we lost to Tulane. Everyone's freaking out. We lost to Tulane, lost to Tulane. And then Tulane ends up going on to 
you know, they, they beat USC in the bowl game. And then this year without Tajay Spears, they pushed Ole Miss the limits already in week two, right? Like they're a talented program where they got something going. I don't know what JT Daniels finishes the season up with Rice, how that looks, but he clearly added a new element to that team. And does that finish that way for them? You know, I, I don't know. What I will say, and this is the last, this will be the last thing. A lot of people say what comes next should be, I think the comment was a, a Joseph Duarte tweet about Dana Hogerson, right? Um, that, A, I mean, sure. Are there coaches you could have that are better? Sure. Are there coaches you have that are worse? Sure. But at the end of the day, we've got to remember that half of America's college football teams lost on Saturday or lost over the weekend, I should say, right? Every one of them is talking their water cooler on Monday. Every one of that's 50% about we need a new coach. Even Alabama, who lost to Texas on Saturday night around the same time as this game was happening and so on. So I didn't watch any of it. But I, I do think that it's worth pointing out that you've already got people at Alabama with Nick Saban talking on their message boards, talking on their Twitters, talking in all those circles about can Nick Saban win in the NIL era? That's a real conversation happening. Legendary Nick Saban, can he win in the NIL era? Right? Every, I mean, Sonny Dykes went, had a crazy good year in his first year at TCU. They lose to Colorado. People want to throw him in the can. Right? Baylor and Dave Aranda, they're talking about getting rid of their guy because he's lost a handful of games in a row. Never mind the fact that there was pass interference probably in that game and the whole thing could have changed. Right? Like, Everyone that loses goes straight to head coach right away. That doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it fair. I do think there's accountability and blame to be had. And at some point, things got to get fixed. But there's a weird conversation that everyone seems to have. And if everyone's having it, what's the actual conversation you should have? Or what's the actual answer to that question about what comes next? Hopefully, it's a big one over TCU and they keep it moving. Hopefully, things keep going right. Hopefully, this program grows into what we both think it can grow into. We'll be here doing it Locked on Cougs each day. We'll talk about it wherever it does go. You can also find me at Painsworth 512 P-A-I-N-S-W-R-T-H-512, and all of your social media handles, Twitter, X, it's Twitter, uh, Blue Sky, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, all the things. I'm at Painsworth 512. Thank you all so much for tuning in today and making us your first listen for your second listen I'm going to recommend Locked on Astros. Uh, the Astros are coming off of a fun weekend, to say the least, um, and building towards winning the AL West after what's been a tumultuous year, doing a great job coming over there, so make sure you go check them out. Locked on Cougs is a proud of Locked on Podcast Network, and that means your team every day. Go Cougs. Go Cougs.